Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this night from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text, which engages our hearts and our minds, is taken from the epistle lesson from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. This is our text. Perhaps you were mo modeled or taught as you were growing up to finish your prayers with the phrase, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if so, what a good thing as we look at the name of Jesus tonight. We ask ourselves that great question of William Shakespeare in his play, Romeo and Juliet, what's in a name? And so we look at the name of Jesus, and we look at names and their significance. I want to share with you an author by the name of Paul Dickinson. He wrote a book entitled Names. Uh, part of what he has done is he has collected a list of names that are either usual, unusual or strange or peculiar, and people have been given a few of these unusual names, actual names of actual people. And so let's look at a few of them. Magdalena Babblejack, thank the Lord. Maybe you were not named Cletus Claude Felter. Adeline Dingledine. How about Rotten Earp? Joanne Flues Blonder. Maybe Beverage Moose. Laura Von Wrinkleprig. And my personal favorite from the list, Boogtha Boomfumpa. Uh, Dickinson says that sometimes names tend to be prophetic. In 1941, he details that there was a man who was executed in the, at the Florida State Penitentiary in the, using the electric chair, and the name was Will Fry. Also, there was a story of a gentleman who was cleaning windows in Montreal, and uh, he fell, and he was a window cleaner, his name will drop. Prophetic side of names. Dickinson says that there are others who are destined to certain professions because of their name. Uh, for instance, the baseball coach whose name was Joe Bunt as the baseball coach, or two gentlemen who opened up a church equipment store, and their names were O'Neill and Prey. And then lastly, there's the plaster contractor whose name is Will Crumble. Well, tonight we behold the man and we behold his name. His name is Jesus. That name means the Lord is salvation. The Lord saves. What a great name for our Lord to accurately depict for us and for all the world what he's come to do. Behold the one who has come to save you from your sins to give you eternal life, the name Jesus, the name above all names. It's the name which has authority. It's the name we put onto our prayer. It's the name put upon us. This one sent by God is the one who will save his people from their sins. He's the one sent to save you. So we continue this evening with our Lenten posture and what's our posture? It's a posture of penitence, contrition, sorrow over our sin and the suffering that sin has caused. But it's also a, po a posture of prayer. As we think about our relationship to our Heavenly Father, we go to Him in prayer as our Lord has taught us. Yes, the Lord has given us the Lord's Prayer. John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer we begin to take a look this evening at the God who prays. Last week, Pastor Halke began our Ash Wednesday service with this idea of Jesus, the God-man who hungers. Pilate uttered those prophetic, those, uh, those words from his a trial where he says to the people, behold the man. And as Jesus, afflicted with suffering and with beating, and with humiliation, there he is in front of the people. Who is this man they are to behold? Well, he's the one 
who hungered for them, the one tried in the wilderness, the one tempted by the devil for 40 days, the one familiar with all the suffering that everyone goes through, this Jesus hungered and tempted for God's people. He tasted physical death, death for our sins and the sins of the world. Not only do we behold the man who hungers, but we behold the one who prays. What's your understanding of prayer? What's your model of prayer? What's your routine as you go to God in prayer daily? There's a saying that says, is prayer your steering wheel or is prayer your spare tire? As we look at Jesus tonight, we learn a lot about his posture of prayer. We know that he is the perfect high priest sent by God for his people. We behold the one who models prayer for us. Jesus is the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Who is this Melchizedek? Well, if we look at Jesus, Melchizedek will teach us a little bit about our Savior this evening. First reference in Genesis 14, you get this encounter of Abraham and Melchizedek. Abraham comes back from defeating the kings, and he comes to Melchizedek. And instead of Melchizedek offering Abraham something, Abraham offers Melchizedek. We get this tenth number, a tenth. He offers him an offering. Melchizedek is offered uh, this, uh, this sacrifice by Abraham. So the writer of Hebrews name drops. He gives us a little bit of information about Melchizedek. If we were to look in verse 18, we see that this, this writer is speaking about Jesus. You are a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Well, what's that all about? Who is this Melchizedek and what is he doing? Well, first off, we know that Jesus occupies what's called a threefold office. Jesus is a prophet, Jesus is a priest, and Jesus is a king. And you see this all throughout Jesus' ministry, occupying this threefold office, but, but what's a priest? Well, a priest is someone who makes intercession on behalf of the people before God. And this can be done through offering sacrifices, this can be done through prayer and intercession, going before God and asking for the life and the mercy of God for the people. And Moses sets up a law, and that law of Moses authorizes priests to act as God's agents in the divine service, and it empowers them to do his work. So those priests sent by God to act before him and to do the work of the people. But what's unique about Melchizedek is that Melchizedek is, there's two features of him. He's the king of Salem, and he's priest of God Most High. Interesting that we're told these two details about Melchizedek. It gives us a little more information about Jesus. As we look about what Salem means, Salem means peace. Uh, the, this idea of peace. Jesus is our prince of peace. Melchizedek is the king of Salem, peace. You get this word shalom in the Hebrew. This word is a relative word, uh, Salem, Salem. You have Jerusalem, you have the city of peace, but you have this idea of the prince of peace, the king of peace. Secondly, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. This is significant. When you link Jesus to Melchizedek, like our text does today, it links Jesus to being a king of righteousness. He is the king of righteousness. He's the, a priest. Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of God. Jesus, king of peace, prince of peace, and he's a priest as well. As we look at this word, righteousness, that's what Melchizedek means. That's what Jesus brings us. We look at Jesus being a, being a prince of peace and Melchizedek meaning king of peace. Well, Jesus brings peace wherever he is. He brings peace to God's people. He brings peace to you this evening. He brings peace among the holy gathering of God's people. 
as we think about Melchizedek, as we think about Jesus, as we think about prayer, what's interesting about Melchizedek is that no priests come after Melchizedek in the line. You have Aaron and the Levites, their priests, but they come and they go. They die and they're replaced. There is nothing mentioned about Melchizedek ever being replaced. And some speculation, not fact, because the scripture doesn't clearly illustrate it, but there is some thought that maybe Melchizedek hadn't died, which would raise interest as we look at Jesus being a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? Why does he make a difference? He kind of comes and goes in the scripture. We don't know a lot about him, but we know that Jesus, a high priest, who prays for God's people in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of the Levites, not in the order of Aaron, Jesus from the tribe of Judah in the order of Melchizedek. Interesting. Behold the man. Behold the infant priest born in Bethlehem to take on flesh and blood so that he can pray for you, so he can live for you, so his freshly born flesh can be ripped from his body and sacrificed for you. The blood of Jesus, both sacrifice and priest, good shepherd and lamb of God, offered on the altar of the cross for you, so that this day you would know with certainty God has forgiven you, that God loves you and he cares for you, and he's prepared a place for you because of Jesus, our great high priest, who is well acquainted with our suffering, who knows our sorrow, who's traveled our road, who has come to be our savior from sin and death. There's a lot of linkage between Jesus' ministry and the Old Testament. It doesn't just stop at the Old Testament and begin anew without any connection. There is a thread through the entire scripture. Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, just as Israel had to slaughter the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost so the destroyer would pass over, so too Jesus is the sacrifice for you so that death Sin and the devil would not have the final say. They would not reign supreme. They would not destroy God's people. But that we would have life in his name. What's in a name? In Jesus, there is peace. There is peace for sins forgiven. There is peace at the foot of the cross. For whatever you have done, for whatever failings or sins you have committed, there is forgiveness and there is peace. May that sink deep into your heart and into your soul, into your life this week, that God has taken his wrath out on Jesus and has given you peace. Where you have failed, where you have lacked in devotion to God, where you have been negligent on keeping a tight rein on your tongue, there Jesus has fulfilled God's law perfectly for you. He is your peace. Jesus is the name above all names. His is the name that forgives all your sins. Jesus, the high priest who prays for you. What a comforting thought. What a wonderful reality for us. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in our believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fears. Jesus, the name above cancer. Jesus, the name above sickness. Jesus, the name above disease. Jesus, the name above death. Because Jesus died and rose for you, you have everything the Lord provides. You have forgiveness you have salvation, you have open access to the Father. I pray God bless you in your prayer life as you continue to live in that prayer life saturated in the word of God, going to him daily in prayer as children, leaning into their heavenly Father, asking him 
for those things that he knows that they need. And so pray in the powerful name of Jesus, the world's only savior, the sinner's only hope. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. May God bless us as we behold the man, the high priest, crucified and risen for us. And may we always pray in his name. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for that wonderful example of Jesus, our great high priest. May we imitate him more and more every day. May you move our hearts to pray as Jesus has taught us, looking for opportunities to be in holy conversation with you, lifting up the cares and needs of our not only our own lives, but of those around us and your world. Bless us as we share the hope that is in us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Guide us that we may be people who live your love and demonstrate the power of the gospel. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. And now may that peace of God...